The next document I want to look at is 12.70 and uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on this document, quite an important one in the context of the audit. Now this is one of the very few places within RAC where we've actually gone and taken the ISAs and copied and pasted the information directly out of the out of the ISA into the guidance of this working paper. And the reason we've done this is ISA 240 is a pretty important um, uh, standard and uh, specifically what we're wanting to look at is these presumptions of a fraud risk that ISA 240 is telling us to make. So ISA 240 is telling us make a presumption of a fraud risk related to revenue recognition. In fact, let me make this a little bit bigger so that you can see with me as I read. Make a presumption of a fraud risk related to revenue recognition. Now I'm sure by this stage everybody has become familiar with this requirement. Uh, we have got to raise a fraud risk over revenue. This is what the ISA is telling us. It is also telling us make a presumption of a fraud risk related to management's ability to override controls. And therefore we must test appropriateness of journal entries, review accounting estimates for bias, and review significant transactions that are outside the normal course of business. Now there is no option given to us here, we've got to do this. Now, how we've approached this in RAC, when we look at journal entries, journal entries we covered, there's a separate audit program specifically for journal entries and that's 20.20 .20, and we'll have a look at that in future weeks. The significant transactions outside the normal course of business, we are also, there are already procedures in place and those procedures fall onto every single audit program that you open. Once we've populated the audit programs, there are two procedures actually going and dealing with these significant transactions. So we've dealt with that paragraph as well already in RAC. What we still needed to do, and this is why we added 12.7 70 uh, a little bit after we uh, released RAC is we needed to go and make sure that we are dealing with this fraud risk related to revenue appropriately and we need to go and make sure that we are reviewing accounting estimates for bias appropriately. So it is those two paragraphs or those two sections that we're dealing with in 12.70. Okay, so that's why you will see that um, there is a little discussion here, what I've just mentioned to you, revenue is on this working paper, um, journal entries is on this working paper, uh, sorry not journal entries has got its own audit program and you'll see it's specifying there and accounting estimates. But you'll see that all we have here is revenue and estimates. Okay, so let's go and have a look at the detail of those sheets and we'll start with revenue. Now again we've gone and uh, documented what it says in the ISA and this is from the application material as well and it is telling us that it is possible to go and uh, rebut this presumption. We can actually go and say um, but in this case for this entity there is no fraud risk. However we've got to document our reasoning. And uh, we've said it a lot bef before in, in this training, um, the, the documentation is what becomes very important. Now, um, I certainly fell into this trap when I was in audit. We'd get a property company and we'd uh, say, look, there's no fraud risk because it's so simple, but we didn't document our reasoning very well. So what we're trying to do here on this working paper is, We've got a question here, based on the above, are there valid reasons with this, within this entity to rebut the presumption of revenue as a fraud risk, yes or no? Now if I go say yes, we can rebut this presumption, then we need to go and give reasons for every single assertion. It's no good um, documenting just like, no there is no fraud risk, we've got to go and give a reason why. Now in a property company, um, what I would say is that we've got very few invoices, it's very easy to go and trace whether or not those invoices are in fact for the valid amounts, that there's no attempted fraud related to the revenue, it's easy to test, whatever the case might be, document that. 
and at least go and say as above if if that's a reason that you feel is sufficient for all of these assertions go and say as above or I would almost go and document cut off well there are only 12 invoices so it's easy to trace that cut off is appropriately applied within the entity and then I'm wanting you to go and confirm as the partner or, or whoever is reviewing this uh, whatever decision you make as to who can answer this question within the firm is this sufficient reason? I can't generate a formula to decide whether or not your your, your reasoning is sufficient, uh, but this is kind of like a uh, double check. So you've given reasons. Are those reasons valid in considering revenue as a fraud risk as well as considering each assertion? Okay. If you go, yes, there is no fraud risk. Yes, we've documented our reasoning. Sorry, and I actually note that I cannot type in here. The reason is I'm not logged in yet. So let me go and log in as a partner. Okay. Give it a moment to catch up. And now I go and I say that I have deemed that my reasoning is sufficient. Okay, then you will not have revenue as a fraud risk when we get to our fraud risk register. However, if you don't believe that there is a reason to rebut the revenue fraud risk assumption, you would just go and say no and you would move on to the estimates working paper. Now the estimates once again, we have uh, gone and documented the information out of the ISAs. And the answers are quite clear here in terms of what we're supposed to do with estimates. And once again, um, one of the issues that, that I certainly noted in my audit career was that we would get to something like impairment of property plant equipment and you'd go and do a test for impairment. But you wouldn't really know why. I mean, yes, you need to do an impairment test on PPE. Obviously, you need to go and consider valuation. But impairment is actually an estimate. And for me, there was just no link between the ISA 240 discussion on estimates and what we actually did in our audit. So was that estimate a fraud risk or not? If it was a fraud risk, we should have gone and done far more procedures on impairment than what we actually did. But if we decided that there was not a fraud risk, then we could have gone and done less. But nowhere did we document that decision in the process. And this is what uh, this worksheet is all about. It's going and documenting based on the estimates that you identified in 10.20. If you recall what we did in 10.20, we went and identified what all the components were that are applicable and uh, we go, went and decided what estimates are applicable for each of those components. We now need to go and do two procedures on every single estimate in the financial statements. And this, at this point, I'm still in the planning phase, maybe you don't have the information at your disposal in order to go and do these procedures. So it might be something that you need to go and do uh, once you arrive at the client or maybe you actually need to send a planning team out before the audit commences to go and hold these discussions. Procedure A is evaluate whether the judgments and decisions made by management in making the accounting estimates included in the financial statements, even if they are individually reasonable, indicate a possible bias on the part of entities management that may represent a risk of material misstatement due to fraud. If so, the auditor shall reevaluate the accounting estimates taken as a whole. Okay. Now, what is it telling us? Review judgments and decisions made by management related to all of these estimates separately and in aggregate. So let's go and have a look at impairment. You go and do the audit and um, you go and ask them about property plant and equipment and you ask them, well, have you impaired property plant and equipment? Their answer is no. Does that mean there has been no estimate? It doesn't. Management judgment is that there is no impairment necessary. That is their judgment. What if they are busy applying for a very big loan from the bank? Do you think they will want to go and impair their assets at this point? Or do you think they're going to rather skip it over and do the impairment next year when, um, when they've got the loan from the bank already? Okay. Uh, impairment no, or the lack of impairment does not indicate no 
estimate is in place. So we need to go and have a look at the impairment of PPE, discussions with management. Then we need to go and look at the ISAs, uh, sorry, the IAS statement on property plant equipment, IAS 16. It goes and gives us a whole lot of impairment indicators. In fact, the impairment standard as well is that I, IAS uh, 36, I think, is dealing with impairment. Um, go and read up on that. Go and look for those indicators of impairment and go and document that fact and indicate whether or not you believe that management is exercising uh, judgment to misstate the asset. So is there bias in their reasoning behind wh what estimates they make? Depreciation. If they use all of the depreciation rates, for instance, of SARS, does this indicate management bias? Or if they write everything off over one year, or if they write everything off over 50 years, is there management bias in place over depreciation, useful lives, residual values? We've added here stock obsolescence, trade and other receivables, the doubtful debt provision. These are just a few of the estimates that we raised in 10.20. Now, a couple of the um, issues that uh, may be worth addressing is, for instance, um, you've got shareholder loans, interest-free shareholder loans. What does the standard say? We need to measure them at amortized cost, but we have no interest rate and we have no repayment period. Now, the interest rate isn't a problem because we need to uh, put them at amortized cost at market rate. So we could say prime is the market rate, but there's no repayment period. So therefore, there's no way for us to go and calculate the amortized cost. Um, and for that reason, we can then go and document that, well, because there is no interest rate, because there is no repayment period, then there is no bias by management to try and mistake the financials. We just have to carry it at its carrying value. There's nothing we can do to the value. So amortized cost is fine. What if you suddenly notice, hang on, but this loan is actually reducing by 10,000 Rand a month? and management is not informing us of this, we need to go back and consider do we need to um, do an amortized cost recalculation. So procedure A is going and evaluating those judgments and decisions by management. Procedure B is a retrospective review of management's judgments and assumptions related to significant accounting estimates reflected in the financial statements of the prior year. Now we need to go and have a look at our prior year column in the financial statements. Go and have a look at what management judgments were in place last year. So let's say, for instance, we're now a year later. Management did not impair their assets last year. They got this big loan, and now suddenly they've impaired all their assets. This sounds to me like there is management bias in the way that they're doing estimates. What this ultimately means is if we're finding management bias, we have got to raise a fraud risk. Why? Because we have management who are intentionally misstating the financial statements. Even if it's minor, we need to consider this. We have a fraud risk. That means we need to go and do additional procedures over and above those procedures that we would normally do. So we need to raise the risk level. Now, if we go and document that depreciation is at SARS rates, and uh, we document that there's been no change in rates. We get here and we say, based on the above, on these procedures, should this be considered a fraud risk? And you know what? No, we're not going to consider this a fraud risk. But we have documented in detail why we have decided that. So we override ISA 240 because we've done the two procedures that they have set out for us and based on that we believe that there is no management bias and therefore we can go on with our audit without a raised fraud risk on this item. Those items where we feel there could be management bias here still, we leave as a fraud risk and we let that flow through to our fraud risk register. Okay, so that is the process of 12.70. Uh, We're just trying to address these issues um, under ISA 240. Um, again, we don't want to try and find as many risks as possible, otherwise our work is going to be very difficult, but we need to go and find the right risks. And if some of these things are actually the right risk, we need to go and do something about it. We can't just ignore it and forget to document this pretty crucial information. If your uh, documentation in the cell once again becomes too long, rather go and put a hyperlink in, put your additional working paper in the background um, rather than trying to complete it in this little cell uh, that's going to make it look a lot neater.